asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Wrote about this on the website about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I was moved by it. I was genuinely moved by it. Watched the ITV documentary Boarding Schools, The Secret Shame Exposure. And it was a brilliantly made film, disturbing, but but very important, I think, eminently important, that um, it followed Alex Renton as he tried to get to the bottom of um, how much did the people running schools know about the sexual abuse of boys and how much did they work hard to cover it up. Alex is a very well-known journalist and author and he wrote about his own experiences in a book called Stiff Upper Lip, Secrets, Crimes and the Schooling of a Ruling Class. And I did say earlier, and I meant it, if you go on, I'm, I'm going to tweet, obviously, links to, and I'll put Facebook links to where you can get the book. I recommend you do get it. Uh, the book has been incredibly well reviewed, as disturbing and all as the topic is. Alex experienced this himself when he was attending Ashdown House Boarding School in East Sussex. And uh, I'm very grateful to him for coming on the programme today. Alex, welcome to the show and thanks for doing it. How are you? Hey, Rich. I'm fine. Thanks for having me. And I meant what I said about the film. It's really, really moving. And I'm going to ask you one of those silly, boring questions that you've probably been asked a million times. But because I've, I've had a little bit of experience with childhood trauma, nothing like you, I'm always interested to know, writing the book and making the film... Is there a therapeutic aspect to that, Alex, in dealing with, you know, your own experiences, your own life? Yeah, of course there is. I mean, I think, you know, I I was someone who, like many people, uh, sat, hid my experience of of sexual assault as a child, you know, for for most of my adult life. And, and, And for all of us, shedding light on it, coming out with it, you know, beating the abusers who told us to keep quiet by speaking up is fantastic. And I'm really lucky because I was a journalist already. So, you know, I had a ready made audience and people to listen to me. And, and, um, and, and I, you know, and equally, you know, I'm a professional. I mean, it's my living as well. Uh, I mean, I have to say <laughs> it's not, not a great living doing this particular work, but it, but it, but I, you know, I feel I can bring my professional side and my personal side to it. So that's great. And, and, you know, I was thinking when the film went out, I thought, you know, it is an act of revenge as well. And revenge can be therapeutic. You know, and the, I mean, they're, they're dead, the two men who abused me most. But, you know, they are spinning in their graves. And I feel really good about that for them and, and everybody, for me and for everyone else whose lives they screwed up. That's an interesting thing. Many years ago, somebody said to me about children who'd been badly physically abused and beaten. They said there's a kind of a catharsis thing. There's a juncture. You want to get revenge. And I remember a psychiatrist saying to me many years ago, Alex, um, you know, you either get on with living and dealing with the things that happened to you and accept that you couldn't have done anything about it and move on, or you go and kill the people that did it to you. Yes. <laughs> you know? And he actually said, well, and there's nothing wrong with that, he said. I was amazed by that. But- there is something in between, perhaps. I mean, one of the great things about, I mean, I mean, a lot of people were abused at my very smart, um, you know, quite famous preparatory school in Sussex. And one of the great things is that we've been lucky enough, you know, and it can be really, it's very hard to get this to happen, to, to see one of our teachers jailed. And a guy, uh, my science teacher, he didn't abuse me, but abused many of my friends. Uh, and so, you know, we didn't have to murder him. I would say having him stand up in court and, Letting those men who had sat thinking there was no justice for 40 years finally see there was justice or some kind of it was brilliant. And that's, you know, we were really lucky because, you know, I've spoken to hundreds of child abuse victims or emailed with them. and, And that's so rare, so rare that that should happen. But that, you know, and that's revenge therapeutic. And it's good for children today, because it tells the institutions today that, and the and the abusers that they may not get away with it, they need to um, watch out. 
Yeah, the, the the film itself, I think I didn't check today, but I think the ITV player, it might still be available. Boarding schools. It's still available. Chain. I mean, and someone's put it on YouTube as well. I'm really glad about that. Oh, that's I mean, great yeah. if it's on not YouTube. Official, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, not officially. We'll get the link and we'll we'll tweet it out. A lot of questions, great. understandably, coming in um, for you. Um, and uh, I'm just going to say, Alex can be found at alexrenton.com as well. Follow him on Twitter, but go to alexrenton.com. Um, bookmark the website there. The film was extraordinary. We'll talk about it in, in a few minutes. When did you first speak about it, Alex? How old were you when you first told somebody what had been going on? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm lucky. I mean, I, I've always, you know, I, I I've had a a life with as an adult with people who've loved me and and been concerned about me, and I was able to talk to you know, girlfriends uh, about it quite early. So I wasn't one of those, and I know there are many who, who sat on it and were completely alone with the story for most, you know, for all their lives. But I went public with it in 2014, um, chiefly because I realised that some other kids from my school had got it together to um, go to the police um, and start a compensation case. And I realised, you know, this was on the front of the Daily Mail because... You know, the Queen's nephew went to my school and, and so did uh, Damien Lewis and Boris Johnson. So, you know, this was high profile that, that I that I had evidence that would support their case. So I needed to go to the police as well. And then I'm a journalist. I thought, what do you do next? You write about it. And that, of course, um, was cathartic for me. Uh, and that, that was early 2014. But it also produced uh, a, an unbelievable deluge of of more allegations sent to me. But people, if, you know, people, I, you know, I'm privileged, was privileged because I think people, you know, because I'd been through it, felt they could tell me their story. And, and in some cases, and this ITV film was the latest, we were able to investigate their stories. This is incredible because when I announced you were coming on today, I got emails from two people, just two people today. Obviously, I, yeah. wouldn't, obviously I wouldn't pass on your details, but I said, look, uh, obviously data protection and everything, but I said, look, Alex has a website. You can contact him through there. But they said that um, you particularly, in one of these cases that came to me today, were hugely inspirational for them to start talking about it. You, you know, oh, you being a well-known journalist. And that, 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 that's a fact. When I put it out well, on Twitter really today, you were coming on. It. Yeah, it's really, it, it, it must be incredibly um, no, difficult for people. It, and then when you see that. Yeah, no, right. Sorry, Richard, interrupting you. Not at I, all. No, I've been very lucky. I mean, you know, I'm, I, you know, because as a mainstream major gene, journalist, you know, I'm, you know, there, I have connections, and I can get people to 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 act and do things, which, which, you know, which is sort of unfair, but also if you use it in the right way, it's also a good thing. Uh, I mean, what 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 I do do when I mean people tell me about their email me about their experiences, uh, and I log them. And I have a database which, which you know, is very confidential, obviously, but also I can share it with other people who've been abused. That often helps them to get uh, complaints to the police together, because the police are more likely to listen to a group than to a single individual. So you, you, you know, that 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 can can be useful. What I'm aware of is that as a journalist, you know, I have 150 plus schools with with more than one complaint in my database. I've been able to investigate less than 12 because it's so difficult it's so expensive it takes a lot of time and some of the papers i I write for just have lost interest too which is worrying as well 150 with at least one complaint and uh, yes with more than one with more than one complaint and these are all they're not entire they're mainly private boarding schools i I mean there are also some state boarding schools because bizarrely the british uh government still runs boarding schools particularly for army army officers children but um uh but yeah largely expensive private boarding schools yeah i'm going to mention the book two or three times four times i'm going to put links out to it stiff upper lip secrets crimes and the schooling of a ruling class alex told me today that the paperback is out very soon in a week or so um all good online retailers all good shops and go to alexrenton.com was it a, a friend of mine has listened to the program? Somebody who was a huge help to me, Jean Ann Crowley. Jean Ann's a very famous actress in Ireland, mm-hmm. lovely woman, and she's listened to this with great interest. And she says she asked me to ask you: Was it an easy sell to the production company to get this on ITV, the documentary? And why did you want to make it when you did? And that's a really good question. Was it an easy sell to get it on? Um, 
That's a really good question. I, I mean, I mean, as everyone knows, I'm sure you know, you know, it, it's tighter and tighter the, the whole media environment in terms of people who want to do this sort of investigative journalism. I mean, I had been doing it for the Observer newspaper, and they, you know, the Guardian Observer is very short of money, and they, and they, you know, they ran out of money and and the ability to go on funding this research. So I was really pleased when actually ITV or ITN it is their investigative side. A, a brilliant producer there called Delilah Jerry uh, came to me about a year ago and said, you know, I, I keep hearing that you've got more more schools that need investigating. Um, uh, you know, can, can can we can we cooperate and do it? So initially that was it. I was going to hand over some of the data I had. I mean, again, yeah. you know, making sure I had people's permission to do that and, and they were going to investigate. But then uh, and no, I mean, so it came from them and it wasn't hard, I suppose. But I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think ITV sold a lot of adverts on the back of it. I mean, I mean that was public service Probably broadcasting not. by a commercial broadcaster. Which is which um, is which is terrific. And. Yeah, and, and there's so much in the film. Um, I watched it twice. You're brilliant, well, Alex. You're a glutton for punishment. I am a glutton I mean, for punishment. I've taken notes. Yeah, that's really good of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you wouldn't forgive me as um, as I mean, you're you're a journalist. You've been, you know, you've achieved so much. You wouldn't forgive me if I if I hadn't watched it a couple of times and and, and made notes on it. But there's some staggering things, obviously, right? You're you went and, and your professionalism, Alex, has to be commended. And anybody who's seen it, it's absolutely terrific. I mean, it's brilliantly done. You are brilliant. I'm saying that straight. I don't care. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, it might sound sycophantic. I do not care. It's terrific. When you're sitting down with James, you're oh, yeah. you're brilliant in that situation. I mean, how hard must that, that have been? Some of the things he said and the allegations he made. Talk about that. I mean, meeting him and listening to him talking about it in such a kind of a matter of fact way it you know it, it it goes on it's normal and it's still going on and you know no contrition whatsoever how did you feel doing that yeah I, I i mean very i think i mean very grubby actually i i mean i mean you feel quite soiled in fact i mean because the instinct is to get up and punch someone like that on the nose but but you i mean you can't do that you have to be professional and and also you you know, you, we need to hear what these pe- how what, how these people justify and motivate themselves. It is important. I, th- I think there's very little understanding of paedophilia uh, and what drives the people who do it, and, and and you know, which is the lesson in how how to how to combat it as well. That's how you, how we'll learn. So, and we were very dubious about whether we could put him on on. I mean, in fact, we didn't show very much of what was an hour long interview. In fact, but I I mean, I think I mean he. Um, he is gripping. I mean, this is, I mean, just a bit of the background. I mean, I mean, he, this man has been convicted three times and done two jail sentences for, um, for assaults on young children. And he was a boarding school teacher, assaulted children pretty freely in a boarding school in the 70s and 80s, as did other teachers there. And this seemed to have been smiled at by the by the authorities at the school. I mean, they certainly must have known what was going on. And he had been abused by teachers himself from the age of eight at boarding schools, which is, you know, one of, you know, which is one of the vectors by which people, by which pedophiles, you know, may come up, come about. I mean, it's not, not entirely true, but, uh, but, um, and I think what, what was most tragic and gripping about him was, and worrying for all of us was that you know he had been through rehabilitation. I mean, he was he was his last sentence was suspended because the judge was convinced that he he was cured, but he wasn't. I mean, we you watch the program and you realise this is a completely conflicted man who's capable of saying yes, what I did was abuse, but equally, a young child can give consent. That's what he said. And it can be good for them to have sex with an adult. I mean, I mean that's the the bottom line. That's what he said. Yeah, just to remind our listeners, yeah, yeah. James. He said. Yeah, James is a former teacher who is interviewed by Alex in the film, and exact as Alex has told you there, this is how James behaved in the interview. These are the things he said. He he did say that the boys themselves initi- initiated the relationships, and the twelve-year-olds could give consent as much as a child at any other age or a person of any other age. We're talking about boarding right. schools, the Secret Shame documentary which followed Alex um, around, you know, these schools and interviewing people to find out how much abuse was going on and how much it was covered up. And, and Alex, what you found... Do you know what's very interesting as well? 
I, I spoke for a couple of minutes with um, Alex today and um, very kindly got back to me um, this morning after we'd uh, got in touch with him and I said, rang him and said, look, we'd love to have you on. And Alex said, you know, I am the establishment because Alex's dad, of course, is an MP and he went to these schools. I am the establishment. And that puts you in a very unique position investigating what happened. Of course, because of what happened to you as well, of course, I'm not in any way trying to diminish that. But you're investigating the establishment and it seems that what you're finding is that the establishment, at least through private schools and very expensive boarding schools, that the abuse of boys has been endemic. Did you expect, Alex? I mean, terrible things that happened to you, and I, I could never understand what you went through, but I know it must have been terrible, even though I couldn't understand it. Did you ever think that, you know, as you were as, as you were working professionally, um, you know, going into adult life, doing your thing, did you, did you ever think for a minute that you would discover that it was so endemic in, in, in that world, for want of a better way of putting it? No, no. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still shocked at the scale of it. Uh, I mean, I, and for a long time, I, you know, and other journalists who've looked at this, like Andrew Norfolk on the Times, uh, you know, said, it's clear that the scale of the criminal abuse within the boarding schools is equal to the criminal abuse that went on in other childcare institutions in, in that same period, you know, uh, children's homes and um, young offenders units and so on. Uh, um, it, it, and, and that was, you know, obviously sociologically incredibly interesting. Um, what, what I realised when I started researching my book and and in, and, and what I realised, I mean, I've had, I still haven't got through all the emails I've had since the film was broadcast two two weeks ago. Um, you know, but I've got at least a hundred more allegations, fresh allegations that have come in since then. So, so the scale is huge. What What's really shocking to me after sort of because you know, I wrote a book which also looked at the history of abuse going back to the 19th century within within the schools of the, the elite, um, is that it's not just that the authorities, the people who ran the schools colluded, but that the parents colluded as well. And that I found, that's sort of unique to this particular story. How did and they do really that? How? How, how, how did parents collude? Well, because, I, I mean... I mean, it's hard to say because I mean, well, my father went to one of these schools and so did his father. But but they all knew what went on in these schools, that they were very violent, cruel and unfriendly uh, places. I mean, that's to which very young children, we were sent at seven or eight years old, to which very young children were sent. And that, that was right. It was how it should be, that misery was part of the magic formula for making a member of the British ruling class. I mean, that's completely clear. I mean, and, and was clear from Tom Brown's school days in 1847 onwards. Um, but also that the, the Victorians and, you know, the people at the beginning of the 20th century, they knew that paedophiles were attracted and tolerated in these schools that they often, Evelyn Waugh, the novelist says, um, all the best teachers are pederasts, he goes. Uh, you know, they knew wow. that yeah. the children not only would be lonely and unhappy, they'd also be at risk of assault from the adults. But nonetheless, they sent us. And then, you know, as many, many of my correspondents and some of your listeners will say, when the, when the kids went to mummy and daddy uh, at the end of term and said, Mr. So-and-so is touching me, uh, is, you know, uh, hitting me, is putting his hand on my shorts... Mummy and Daddy didn't listen. Can I ask you a question, Alex? On that, it is—it's a terrible thing to say. Um, yeah. Your 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 father, Tim, of course, distinguished yeah. uh, politician and honourable man. Did you ever have that conversation with um, with uh, your dad, with Tim? Did you ever say, "Why did you send me no, there"? I, uh, no, I didn't. I mean, I I, I think you know, it was clear. I mean, I mean, I, I my parents are still alive. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're still alive. Father, yeah, my, my father's very. Very, very ill now, actually. But, but, but I've talked it all through with my mother, you know. And I know my parents love me, still do. I, I mean, and that may come as sound as a surprise, but they were doing what their culture said was best. And I think also they were defrauded by the schoolmasters. I mean, but and I did tell my mother that when I was eight years old, the maths teacher was touching me in a way I didn't like, and she went and complained. 
but she, as happened, I now realize very often, was sort of bullied, bullied out of taking her complaint further by by the headmaster's wife, and um, uh, and I think the school was very practiced at doing that. But um, but yeah, no, I think I think she, you know she 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 we you know we have a good relationship. Where I'm lucky I've been able to talk it through with her. But she she accepts that she made a, they made a mistake. But no, I never got to talk it through with my father, and that's now not possible, sadly, because he's he's too ill. Well, I'm sorry to hear he's not, and I genuinely mean that. I'm sorry to hear he's not ill, and uh, you know, I, 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 nothing, nothing ever happened to me, the likes of what happened to you. I had physical abuse, and it was difficult when I was younger. I did have conversations. Uh, this is not about me now, so I'm not going to start talking about me. But just because we're talking about this, I did have conversations with people later on. Who, who didn't do me any harm, but who knew what was going on and didn't do anything. And I felt I had to kind of confront them. Not in a very, you know, angry, challenging way, but in a kind of a way like, well, mm. why didn't you do stuff at the time and why didn't you see stuff? And looking back, Alex, one of the things that strikes me, and I'm just going to remind our listeners again, we're privileged to have the journalist, author and filmmaker Alex Renton on the line tonight. Alex is the author of Stiff Upper Lip, Secrets, Crimes and the Schooling of a Ruling Class, Get the book, folks. Go to alexrenton.com. You've got to support this type of journalism because Alex did speak a little bit earlier on about how difficult it is becoming to do this sort of journalism. So you've got to support people like him. Go and buy the book. And he made the uh, film with the production company Boarding Schools of Secret Shame Exposure. Um, do you ever think... I mean, there must have been people at, at the school in East Sussex, East Sussex Ashdown House. There must have been teachers there, maybe young men... And they didn't do that because they wouldn't have been evil people. They wouldn't have done that. But yet maybe they knew what was going on, Alex, and they didn't speak up. Does that concern you? It, it does concern me. Uh, and, and I've heard from a couple of them. I, I mean, I mean, and, you know, some of them were very, young, I mean, much younger than me. I mean, the school, although it, you know, as we were saying, catered for, fa- you know, rich and famous people, you know, employed some very cheap, cheap teachers and, and uh, often uh, sort of gap year interns. And I've heard from a couple of them who certainly said that they saw things that worried them. But I think, you know, in those days, in the mid 70s, you know, there were no mechanisms whatsoever for reporting. The school was hardly inspected. It was a private company owned by the headmaster. And and the parents were ridiculously trusting of all the, these things. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I certainly, I mean, it's important to say this and not accusing every teacher who, at my school, but, but we, you know, the, the group of us who were there at the time, you know, know that there were allegations against half of them, which is a huge amount. Amazing amount. Um, most of them, most of them are dead now. But, um, but what really worries me, Richie, and this is, you know, important for today is that I still get emails of teachers today going, I tried to make a complaint. The headmaster said, if you want to keep your job, shut up. And again and again, people warned that if they took something further, then they would not get a reference when they left the school. And what we heard earlier this week, uh, Tuesday, um, was that um, the government has yet again rejected the notion that it should be a legal duty to report the abuse, the suspicion of the abuse of a child in an institution, which is the law in most countries. But it isn't here. And the thing is, these problems are still happening in institutions that look after children, boarding schools for the posh or, or ordinary schools for the um, for the, the less posh. That's an inversion, by the way. I mean, you know, for anybody listening to what Alex just said there, that it isn't compulsory here to report, that's an inversion. I mean, we're supposed to be decent people, most of us. How can they explain that? What does that mean to somebody like you, Alex? It, I'm absolutely, I mean, it's a great, huge disappointment to me and thousands of other people, and, and including great men like Tom Perry of Mandate Now, who, who was is himself a survivor of child abuse in a boarding school, who's been campaigning for it for, for, for much of the last 10 years. It, it is unbelievable. And, and, and as many, many child care professionals say, you know, we cannot have a, a serious promise that we look after children in regulated institutions properly. I mean, actually, this also includes uh, vulnerable adults um, without 
the legal duty to report the suspicion or the accusation of, of an act of abuse. It, it, you, you can't have it because you can't protect whistleblowers properly. And then that's the key thing is that whistleblowers don't know that you know, there is a system if they come forward, if they've seen something nasty. So we have a less, you know, we're, we're a country, but you know, every two weeks is another child abuse scandal. Football academies, you know, the most recent and so on. Um, but we have a less good child protection regulatory system than America, Australia, half the Western European countries. And the government today said it didn't want to do it. Uh, sorry, two days ago. Got to ask you this. We talked about this today, you and I, briefly. Look, I, I come yeah. from a um, working class background. I'm a working class boy. You can tell by the accent. And... Um, you, you know, I suppose a lot of people listening to the program are, um, you know, working income, middle income families. There is a prevailing opinion, I think, um, certainly amongst our audience, and I know amongst many people I meet in Manchester, that there is a problem with the ruling class and child abuse and the cover up of it. And when you talk to people, and we're not just talking about people who speak without thinking or, you know, who don't have sophistication. We're talking about sophisticated people who think and they say, it seems to us with the things we've heard come out about Savile and other entertainers and then politicians over the years and uh, the Dickens dossier, of course. You have Mike Veal at Wiltshire Police saying that he's convinced the stories about Edward Heath were true. Um, the Haute de la Garenne, the, the, the Haute de la Garenne home, all the abuse that went on there. <laughs> What What is it about the establishment, the political class and the ruling class that we see so much or we're hearing so, so many historic um, claims and counterclaims about abuse? What, what does that mean to you? Is there a problem with the political class, the ruling class, do you think? I must, you know, I have thought about this a lot, obviously. I, I mean, where I know there's a problem is with what appears to be a British establishment addiction to cover up, where, where whether it's in the private commercial sector or in the public sector, whether it's in the BBC or the NHS or the Savile or, or um, in these schools that I've been looking at, you know, the first people seem to reach for the carpet to sweep things under it rather than do the obvious decent you know, gen, you know, generous thing, which is is be transparent and admit your mistakes and get the criminals dealt with. And and we it happens again and again, and it always, you know, I, I worked for Oxfam for a while, Richie, and there was a wow. cover up there as well. And as usual, it's come back to bite the bosses um, and show them how very badly they did wrong and cause huge damage to a good institution in that case. But. Um, so there is an addiction to that. And I, I wonder if the British establishment is more addicted to cover up than, than the, that in other countries, because those people who went to these schools watched crimes and injustices and cruelties being covered up when they were children and thought this is the right way to, for, that this is how it should be. Whether there's something deeper than that, which is very specifically about high profile powerful paedophiles and protecting them in an organized way i i can't i you know i don't think i don't know any more or have any more evidence than the average person i mean i mean i'm i've you know, and as I say, you know, I went to Eton. I, my father was a politician. I, I'm a victim of child abuse myself. I'm quite well placed to know that. But I, 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 uh, you know, I, I say everything I see. I mean, I, I, I've had too many lies told to me in my life, so I do. I am transparent. I'm, I'm not. I know that the establishment covers things up. Whether there's, they specifically covered up. Child abuse rings in the seventy in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. I just don't know. I'm horrified by the thought. By the thought of it, yeah. I've looked into it over the uh, years in programs yeah. I've made, and not just um, this independent program, but commercial programs I've made. And I've spoken mm -hmm. to people about the, you know, the infamous Franklin Credit Union scandal in the states, which some people say yeah. was a hoax, but there's an awful lot of evidence to suggest that. It wasn't a hoax and that very well known Republican people were transporting children around the country to be raped. You know, there's a lot of 
questions I think to be asked about people like Jeffrey Epstein and others and Lolita flights and, and I also know Alex because I'm I've been around a long time not as long as you although we're not too there's not too much difference in age between us but I also know that sadly in the age of social media there is a lot of nonsense that gets thrown into the mix about things that you know m- might not have happened but um, to hear you know I'm going to play a little clip and I know we, we, we said 30 minutes and I won't keep you too much longer I really appreciate you coming on by the way no, I, no, want, I, want to, I, want, I want to play a little clip of Tim Fortescue who gave an extraordinary interview to the BBC back in 1995 and uh, Tim was former um, chief whip of the Conservative Party and to his credit although, although what he's saying is absolutely heinous he does grimace and wince when he's being very candid with the BBC documentary team when he talks about some of the things that went on it's the kind of casual manner he says it. I mentioned this to Alex today, by the way. I'm not shanghaiing Alex with this. I just want to play it and, and, and get his thoughts on it. Um, let's have a listen to um, Tim Fortescue. Anyone with any sense who was in trouble would come to the whips and, and tell them the truth and say, no, this, I'm in a jam. Can you help? It might be debt. It might be um, a scandal involving small boys or any kind of scandal which um, a member seemed likely to be mixed up in, they'd come and ask if we could help. And if we could, we did. And we would do everything we can because we would store up brownie points. If, I mean, that sounds a pretty pretty nasty reason, but it's one of the reasons, is if we can get a chap out of trouble, then he'll, he'll do as we ask for ever more. Of course, anybody listening to that will wonder why in 1995 somebody didn't say to Tim Fortescue, Tim, we'd like to have a you know an informal conversation with you about some of those people, but that never happened. And as a survivor, Alex, I don't know if you like that term, survivor, what do you think of what Tim Fortescue said, the casualness of that? No, it, it, it's, um, it, it's a terrible, it, it's a terrifying, and, and I mean, and clearly honest admission. I mean, I mean he... Why would the guy say it unless it were unless it were true? I mean, it's, and I think, you know, it's interesting because he was a whip, uh, a Conservative Party whip in the early seventies. I think that's right in saying yeah, the, yeah. the first Ted Heath administration, you know, and of course Heath himself is one of the people accused. But um, and you know, it we know that at that point. In a, in a bizarre turn of British culture, that that cho- that sex with children was more acceptable to a certain slice of society. I mean, and and that paedophiles were tolerated in the House of Commons. Cyril Smith being one of the most the most obvious example of all. So it's it's not wholly surprising. I sort of you know, I, I think a huge amount of things happened in the seventies. I mean, not least you know, we the Labour Party were talking to the paedophile information exchange at yeah, the same time because yeah, yeah. paedophile rights were seen as somehow on a on a par with other sexual rights, including uh, gay rights. Um, it was a really odd time. I I I hope that sense was seen. I do know that people like Fortescue and all those Tory MPs and Labour MPs who went to, because there were many of them, who went to single sex male public schools were very used to the notion of um, underage sex between men um, because that was absolutely rife in their schools. I just, I you know, I, I wonder. I hope things have moved on. I'm not sure, but that, but I don't doubt that there were cover-ups in the 70s. I'm sure that's true. It's um, it's hard to answer, Richie, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is. It is. Look, I've interviewed everybody. I have yeah. all, victims. I've interviewed politicians. Um, you know, I've spoken. I've spoken at great length over the years to people like David Icke about this. Now, David gets. You know, there are people in in this country who, who think David's theories about things are ridiculous. But I know, I'm talking about the nature of reality and things, but I know that back in the early 90s, people were coming to David and talking to him about uh, Peter uh, Morrison and Edward Heath and others. And yeah. this was information that was shared with people. I just, it's not because I want to believe it, Alex. I just do believe that VIP paedophile rings were operating all the evidence is there to suggest it without having absolute definitive proof that there were uh, organised groups of people very, very high up. And I think 
with the Dickens dossier disgrace. I mean, Leon Britton, you know, people will say it's very cheap because you can't libel the dead. It's a cheap thing to do as a presenter, but I'm not being cheap. You know, Britain should have been interviewed under caution. Um, Greville Janner should have been interviewed properly under caution, whether he was innocent or not. Oh. No, no, I, you know, I, I, mean, I don't, I don't, I, I can't argue with this. And also, it, it's not an area that I've looked at. I mean, yeah. I mean, because you know, I, I know, you know far more than I do. I mean, I read all the headlines. I mean, and I read the stories. But and a lot of journalists I know who I respect, like you, who have ha, are pretty convinced about this. Um, I what I do think, and this is you know, is a that you know we need to get to the bottom of this because these. You know, this is truth and reconciliation, reconciliation stuff. I mean, and 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 prosecution stuff. These cancers can't be let to lie in a society. They need to be rooted out and examined, and so we can all move on. Uh, and with any luck, and the victims, um, you know, given that right to you know to finally get justice to speak it, out and where and where possible compensation. I've got one final question yeah, for you. Well, Thanks. It, can I make one, one one secondary point on that, Richard? You but, can but also, go ahead. Well, what I, I'm well aware of is that, you know, and I've talked to criminologists in this area and, and, you know, and the police who are overwhelmed now with historic abuse complaints. And there is a really important point is that we have a major problem with paedophiles, predatory paedophiles in society today. They are part of society and we're still not policing them properly. The law doesn't work um, and our understanding of them is too little. And the, the awful thing is that 80, 85% of sex child sexual abuse happens in the family circle so that's why some academics and criminologists in the area go go i'm, I'm sorry but yes i'm concerned about the institutions but it's that's a fraction of what's actually going on in terms of child abuse and that we we really do need to address that side because that's where most children in britain who are abused or abused within the home or among friends of their family. That remains an absolute fact. It's a very good point to make. And just one final question. You did, of course, um, obviously speak with the um, the Boarding Schools Association and yes. Robin Fletcher, the chief executive, who seemed to say that, you know, schools will do everything they can to listen to children and um, that there isn't any school that um, doesn't want to listen to victims and act as quickly as possible and to say sorry. Did you believe Robin Fletcher? Well, I, I was impressed by Robin Fletcher because he's gone a lot further. I mean, he now says that he believes that it should be a, a legal duty to report abuse and that he fought, he his member schools of it you know and he represents 480 almost all the private boarding schools in britain you know have a will be kicked out of his association if they don't report allegations so that that's that's good he also said they get a couple of allegations a month in conversation with me which shows wow. there is still a problem a major problem still going on did i believe i mean did i believe it you know that was then and this is now and there's no longer a threat to children in boarding schools no of course i don't there will, if you send children away from those who love them and, you know, protect them for more than professional reasons, then children will be vulnerable and predators target places where there are vulnerable children. Folks, do us a favour. Do, I can't stress this enough, I mean this, do support uh, journalists like um, Alex Renton. Uh, do buy the book. The um, the documentary is, of course, um, on the ITV player, but Alex said it might be on YouTube at the moment. But do better than that. Do go to alexrenton.com, go to an online retailer and pick up Stiff Upper Lip, Secrets, Crimes and the Schooling of a Ruling Class because one of the most disappointing things, we've heard some terrible things this evening, but one of the things that is worrying, of course, is investigative journalism and the the pressures coming under it as um, plurality disappears. Alex, it was a genuine pleasure and honour to meet you. Thanks yeah. for coming on and thanks for doing what you do for the many other people who never had anybody to speak for them and didn't have anybody to go to for reading their emails, for calling them back, for speaking to them. Uh, I think you're an amazing guy. I really mean that. Thanks, Richie. And thanks very much for giving me so much time. It was good, good discussion. It was brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Speak again. Bye right. for now. Cheers. Terrific man, Alex Renton, live on the line there. AlexRenton.com. And again, Stiff Upper Lip, Secrets, Crimes and the Schooling of a Ruling Class is his book. You can follow Alex on Twitter. I've tweeted or retweeted um, 
earlier on when Alex said he was coming on the programme. Follow him there. And if this has happened to you at a boarding school and you do want to reach out to somebody, I think Alex is okay with um, me saying go to his website and get get to him through his email. The email on his website goes directly to him. It isn't monitored by anybody else. If you were at a boarding school, uh, a private school, and this happened to you or somebody you know and they've not been able to speak out about it, well, that's one of the ways they can do it. 